Hello MUS 1002 students. In this video, we are going to talk about digital audio and the concept of sampling. Uh, just be aware, this is going to be a long and somewhat technical video, so pause and take breaks as necessary. So, let's get into the technical stuff of digital audio and why it is really, for a musician's perspective, the best thing since sliced bread. Digital audio means that you can edit, change, and manipulate any recorded audio that has been digitally recorded non-destructively. You are not physically changing the recording. You have a digital representation and you can change things without affecting the original audio. This means that you can do things like fix errors in the rhythm of one part or pitch in another part without having to re-record over and over. It means you can sync everything to a master clock and change speed without changing the pitch of the audio. Uh, it means that you can create new sounds out of old ones and play them back on a sampler. It means that you can go completely out there with things like spectral synthesis, granular synthesis, or taking a digital sample and using it as the basis of an entire piece and fragging it, adding effects, doing really cool things with it. So here's just a quick little explanation. Sound travels through the air as changes in air pressure and eventually this hits a microphone. The mic converts changes in air pressure into electrical current. The electrical current goes to what's called the analog to digital converter or the ADC. The ADC samples and quantizes the amplitude that it's receiving from the microphone every X number of times per second. Then that goes to the computer and the computers let you edit this digital audio data in cool ways. So how does this work? It comes down to the ADC and sampling and quantization. The ADC in your audio interface is sampling the electrical signal from the microphone and reporting the instantaneous amplitude or volume or changes in air pressure of the signal that the mic is receiving from the air around it every X number of times per second. This number of X times per second is called the sample rate and is how many samples make up one second of audio. So common rates are 44.1 thousand samples per second that is CD quality. That is effectively the baseline that we're working from for pretty much everything. 48K is the standard for DVD quality and video quality generally. We also have multiples of these like 88.2K, 176.4K, 96K, or 192K. These are very common at pro level gear. There are also higher quality sample rates that we can get to with very, very expensive hardware. Uh, so expensive that very few people own it and it's used entirely for archival purposes at organizations like the Library of Congress or National Public Radio. Quantizing is the assigning of an amplitude value to the sample. So every 44,100 times per second, you're getting the current amplitude value. And the quantization is taking that value and snapping it to the nearest possible value that it can reproduce. The sample resolution is the number of amplitude values available to your analog to digital converter. This is also called the sample width or more commonly bit depth. So let's look at the sample rate first. When you're converting a signal from analog to digital, it is not a smooth process. Analog is a continuous, unbroken signal. There is always a change infinitely small from one value to the next, and it's always this constant series of fluctuations and changes. Uh, there's never a discrete value. However, when you're sampling for digital systems and using an analog to digital converter, we're breaking up the signal into individual discrete slices that the computer can process. So again, the sample rate tells us how many times we're sampling per second. The more times it samples, the smoother the resulting waveform will be, 
and the more realistic the sound, the closer it will be to analog. But there is also a limit. Digital audio cannot recreate any frequencies above one half of the sample rate. This is called the Nyquist frequency after the physicist Harry Nyquist. So here's how the Nyquist theorem works. One half of the sample rate is the Nyquist frequency, which is the max frequency reproducible by the system. So for CD quality, we have 44,100 kilohertz or 44,100 samples per second. Half of that is 22,050 hertz. That is well above the range of human hearing. And that is our maximum frequency. And there's a photo of Dr. Harry Nyquist. So that should be enough. 44.1K ought to be enough for everybody, right? Not quite. Having additional data, having more samples per second, means that we have a smoother digital playback and greater fidelity to the original analog signal. The more samples, the closer it is to the original analog. Arguably, by adding more of the higher end frequency content, we get more sparkle or air as well in the signal. Uh, but more importantly, this is essential for what's called anti-aliasing in digital synthesis, where you're typically working at a higher sample rate within the oscillator or within the synthesizer plugin itself, then you downsample or reduce it before sending that as the output to your digital audio workstation. But most importantly, if you drop the sample rate, if you go below 44.1K, you will hear the change and it's not always going to be good. The lower the sample rate, the more implicit filtering of higher frequencies is present and because it's jumping from sample to sample, the worse the resulting audio will sound. Plus, you can always downsample when you're bouncing the final mix. It's really, really easily done. Uh, you can usually set that up in the DAW, or you can use what's called a Bit Crusher plugin if you want to go for a specific lo-fi aesthetic. Here is just a really quick look at the difference in sample rates. Uh, in part A, you can see where the samples are taken and what the resulting digital result is. And you can see we have very few samples, so it's going to jump from one to the next. Very, very clippy sounding. Uh, with B, we have more samples, so it's going to be a smoother resulting digital waveform. And in C, we have even more, so it's going to be even smoother there. So I said we're sampling X number of times per second, but what are the values of each sample? This is where quantization comes in. Typically, this is a binary value that's normalized from negative one to positive one. Uh, this just makes everything very, very easy to deal with in terms of math because you're dealing with zero to 100% of the signal and zero to negative 100% of the signal because waveforms go both up and down below the center uh, zero line. Uh, that makes everything very, very easy for representation within the audio workstation. So the bit depth controls the value resolution for the amplitude. Higher bit depth is better and gives you a higher dynamic range from the loudest to softest values that can be reproduced by the system. If a value that's sampled doesn't hit one of the values that the system can reproduce, it's rounded to the nearest value. Typically, this is in terms of decimal places. Uh, with 16-bit audio, we get 65,536 possible values. However, with 24-bit audio, we jump up to 16,777,216 possible values of amplitude. This also affects the dynamic range. 16-bit has a range of 96 decibels, which is pretty good for most things. 24-bit has a larger range. It gives us 144 decibels. Uh, please note that the threshold of pain is at 120 decibels, uh, but 
by and large, many, many speaker systems are not going to be able to reproduce that. Why would we want to have a higher resolution uh, of decibels and a higher decibel range? Because it's good for recording quieter sounds and for spatializing or diffusing sounds over multiple speakers. There's also 32-bit. Uh, this is newer. It's not supported by everything. It's technically possible. And this gives us a whopping 192 decibel range from the loudest to softest sound. It also gives us a whopping 4,294,967,296 discrete amplitude values that can be encoded, which makes it overkill for just about everything. But again, if you need really, really quiet sounds, it might be the ticket. Here is a look at quantization. Uh, you can see on the left that we only have one bit quantization. So the result of that is that our resulting waveform is only either fully on or fully off. It is never going to have any values in between. Going up to two bit, we get more values. We have on, off, and an in between. Going up even further, we get an additional state. And as we keep increasing this, we increase the amount of different volume levels that we can reproduce in the system. So, with that out of the way, let's talk about digital audio files and how they work and getting into compression. Uh, as I've noted, this will surprise and it will horrify quite a few people. So there are two major categories of digital audio file formats. There's what's called uncompressed and compressed. Uncompressed files store the audio in 16, 24, 32, or occasionally 64-bit files with a defined sample rate, usually anywhere from 44.1 to 192K. These files can be mono, meaning that there's only one track, Stereo, which is two tracks, or surround. Uh, surround can be anything from more than two tracks. Uh, generally, you would do quadraphonic, which is four, 5.1, 7.1, octophonic. Uh, then you would get into things like ambisonic or Atmos. The most common types of these files are AIFF and WAVE, with WAVE being preferred for professional applications due to its widespread compatibility. There are some other formats like CAF and WMA, uh, but they're exceedingly rare. Compressed files are compressing the data to make a smaller file size. These operate in two different formats. You have lossless compression, which reduces the file size without altering the data. Uh, this is very, very similar to a zip file on your computer, where whatever you've zipped up can be completely recoverable. There are lots of formats for lossless compression, but MP4, OG, Vorbis, and FLAC are generally considered to be the best. Then you have what's called lossy compression. Lossy compression removes material from the audio file using perceptual encoding to remove signals that are masked or covered by other signals at the same frequency, but that have a higher amplitude. Uh, for example, if I had a bass drum and a bass guitar playing at the same time, the bass drum is probably going to be louder at times than the bass guitar. They operate in relatively similar frequency spectrums, though. So using lossy compression, it will cut out part of the bass guitar part whenever the bass drum is playing. Uh, this is basically saving space on things you won't hear. But there are problems. Uh, this can result in artifacts, which are undesirable audio byproducts, like a loss of treble or bass frequencies, ringing sounds, uh, swirling sounds in the higher register, loss of detail, which is generally noticeable in the lower frequency spectrum, and a reduction in the stereo space, as well as the general introduction of noise into the file. Um, also, yeah, you can really hear the missing data. 
Uh, there is a massive frequency reduction over 17K, sometimes going even lower to 15K, which is still generally within the range of human hearing for most people. If a low bit rate is used to encode the files, this becomes very, very noticeable. Common formats for lossy compression uh, include the MP3, which is the basis for almost every streaming service, and the AAC, uh, which is Apple's proprietary format and is used for streaming. Now, supposedly, uh, most non-musicians cannot tell the difference between CD quality and a 256 kilobytes per second uh, MP3 file, but every musician I have ever tested this with can. The only benefit to this type of compression is extreme file size reduction. And nowadays, given how cheap storage space is and how fast SSDs, NVMe drives, and uh, flash storage of all types are, it really makes no sense to use lossy formats anymore, except for streaming. Here is a pretty good example. This is the exact same file. On the left, you have it in a original WAV format. On the right, uh, you have the same thing in an MP3. And it's really noticeable how much has been cut off. If you look at the spectrum, there is a uh, black space above about 16 kilohertz. So you're losing a ton of frequency information there. Uh, it's very noticeable, and this is not even the worst possible example that I could have pulled out to demonstrate this. Uh, let's talk about MP3 because it is probably the most important compressed format. It stands for Motion Picture Experts Group 1, Layer 3. Originally, it was a proposed standard for digital audio in film, and the first committee meeting actually goes back to 1988. Uh, the MPEG-1 standard came out in 1992, and layers 1 and 2 were high-def audio formats and primarily restricted to pro-level gear. Again, MP3 uses perceptual encoding to remove data from a recording and compress the resulting file size by masking frequencies. Primarily, this occurs in higher registers that are harder to hear. As we age, the amount of higher frequencies we can hear drops pretty noticeably. Uh, but because sound is exponential, a lot of this is stuff well over the range of most instruments that most people can't hear anyway. The MP3 dramatically reduces the file size, but at the expense of true analog fidelity. It is highly dependent on the bit rate. Uh, supposedly, for non-musicians, a 128 kilobyte per second MP3 is close to CD quality, but much smaller size. Uh, every musician will be instantly pick it out as being inferior to the original CD quality recording. Lower bit rates do have a tendency to sound a little bit underwater due to the compressed frequency spectrum, so higher bit rates are preferred. Um, generally, if I am purchasing music online from Bandcamp uh, and I can't get it in the original uncompressed wave format, I will try for a FLAC file, and if that is not available, then I will go for a 320 KBPS MP3. A little bit of historical fun. Uh, the very first MP3 was Tom's Diner by Suzanne Vega. Uh, the song originally came out in 1984 and was encoded in 1992. Uh, it was created using a free encoder that the MPEG group had created and then left on an unprotected computer at the University of Erlangen. It was promptly discovered by a Dutch uh, programmer and hacker known as Solo H, who refined it and uploaded it to the web, which quickly led to many encoders coming out and being widely available on the early internet. So the impact of the MP3 was that at first it was very slow to be adopted. 
Um, even though it came out in 92 on the web, I didn't really start using them until high school in uh, 97 or 98. Uh, but it really took off with the rise of easily accessible internet and peer-to-peer -peer services like Napster for file sharing. Uh, these services used decentralized networks linked by a central indexing computer to distribute data. And every user had access to designated files on other users' computers and could download portions of the same file from multiple peers. This uh, type of P2P streaming is still used today uh, for a lot of different services, including things like Spotify and Apple Music that are legitimate and have different servers located in different parts of the world to minimize the, uh, the streaming load. With that out of the way, let's take a look at sampling in a little bit more depth because this is going to be really important. There are three main types of sampling that you need to be aware of. They are recording anal uh, audio digitally, where the analog to digital converter converts the instantaneous amplitude of a signal into a mic uh, into digital data that we previously talked about. The second way is to record a sound to be played back on a sampler. This lets you record a sound from any instrument and play it back at different pitch levels on a computer or on a hardware sampler device. Uh, this is extremely common and incredibly useful in the studio to do mock-ups or to do parts where a performer can't be found. The third type is direct 100% accurate quotation of not just the musical idea, but of the performance of that idea as well. So let's look at type two in detail. The idea of recording individual notes and then allowing them uh, to be played back or transposed on hardware gear was pioneered on the Mellotron, uh, which if you remember Harry Chamberlain's rhythmate, uh, this was so close to his idea that he actually was able to successfully sue them and get royalties for it in uh, settlement in 1963. The way that the Mellotron worked is that tape loops were running in a cabinet under each key. Whenever you pressed the key, you would bring a tape head down to the tape loop and you would hear whatever the loop was that was running underneath it. Traditionally, these were used to create continuous loops of sounds for standard instruments. Uh, it was used by the Beatles, the Moody Blues, Led Zeppelin, and Radiohead, among others. Uh, the Beatles used it on Strawberry Fields Forever for the, uh, the flute sounds. Uh, Led Zeppelin used it for the recorder sounds at the beginning of Stairway to Heaven. The Moody Blues used it uh, very extensively on Days of Future Past, especially in the orchestral sounds on Nights in White Satin. And Radiohead used it pretty much all over Kid A. Going into digital sampling, there were two devices that were both capable of recording and sampling any note or combination of notes starting in the 70s, the Fairlight CMI and the Synclavier. The only problem was the cost. Uh, the CMI was $30,000 and the Synclavier was $200,000, which made them unaffordable except to a lot of studios and very, very rich musicians. Uh, then, in 81, EMU's emulator came out. This was a keyboard-based sampler that could record and transpose two seconds of lo-fi audio. It was comparatively very cheap at $10,000, and because of that, became a studio staple and launched a lot of competitors that had even lower price points like Ensonique's Mirage line and Akai's MPC's. So how does sampling work? Let's take a look at software. Um, I'm going to be using uh, screenshots from TX16WX, which you can find online. They have both a free and a pro version, and it's really fun to play around with. The most common type of sampling is what's called key mapping. This is the most basic technique where you associate a sample with a specific key on a MIDI keyboard or a range of keys on uh, the keyboard or the sampler. 
generally it's the same key as the note of whatever the sample is. This is called the root key. Uh, the root key is the key associated with playing back the sample with no transposition. And it should be the same as the pitch of the sample. So if I have a sample of a violin playing middle C, I would probably want to have that associated with the middle C key on my keyboard. Uh, sometimes, though, an octave transposition is required. For example, if I have a piccolo, uh, traditionally you would play that on a key an octave lower. Uh, with a bass, you would traditionally play that on a key an octave higher, just to make things very, very standard for uh, working with orchestration. The key range, also called the key zone or the key group or the key region, it really kind of depends on the program, is the range of keys other than the root key that will trigger the sample playback and will transpose it to match the pitch of the key played. Generally, this is specified as what's called a low key and a high key in almost every program and is usually graphically displayed on a virtual keyboard as well so that you can see the full range that a sample takes. Traditionally, this is done by changing the speed of the sample playback. Playing it back faster results in a higher pitch and slower results in a lower pitch. So if you're playing an octave above the root key, you would get something that is exactly twice as fast. And in fact, it's a very simple equation that I've got up here. So the equation is r times 2 to the power of x divided by 12. r is the frequency of the root key, and x is the number of keys away from the root key that you're playing. Uh, this could be positive or negative. We divide that by 12 to get a uh, exponent that we're using, and we do it by 12 because in most Western music, you have 12 notes per chromatic octave. So this is really, really cool, and it's very fun to play around with. Um, if anyone ends up taking my uh, Max MSP programming class, you will be using this equation many, many, many times throughout the semester. And here's a picture of uh, TX16WX, and you can see I have two samples, and each of these samples spans multiple keys. So that tells you that they have a key range, a low key and a high key. Uh, one is set to a low key of E4 and a high key of G4, and it has a root key of E4. So that is what the original pitch is. Uh, the other one has a low key of C4 to D sharp 4, and a root key of C4. So anytime I play from C4 to D sharp 4, it will play the sample uh, sitar 2, and it will transpose it upwards since I'm not going below the root key. Then anytime I play E4 to G4, it will play sitar 5, and it will transpose it up or down accordingly. Uh, this is illustrating a pretty good problem of key mapping, which is you can get maybe a minor third worth of transposition before the sound speeds up or slows down to the point that it starts to sound fake and awkward. Additionally, speed-based transpositions make playing chords a little bit weird because the notes in the chord will drift out of sync when you play them back on a keyboard. A uh, possible solution is to use arpeggios, but it still is a little weird. Another big problem with this is that there's no change to dynamics. Uh, you're just hearing the sample played back with whatever volume it was recorded at. So the solution to all of this is what's called multi-sampling. Basically, that is similar to key mapping, but with more samples. And ideally, you want what's called chromatic sampling, where you sample every single note on a one-to-one -one basis so that you have no transposition. Everything is just the root key trigger, triggers that sample. The downside of this, though, is that it takes a lot of hard drive space to store and a lot of RAM to play. Uh, so with this, you want to make sure that every audio file has its pitch in its name. It makes it much easier when you're recording all the files to then uh, just drag them and line them up on the sampler. This is very common for high-end sample libraries and it's very common for keyboard instruments in particular. 
And this shows a quick uh, sampler layout that I did with a toy piano. And you can see that each sample is labeled with the individual root key. So I've got toy piano C4, C sharp 4, D4, E flat 4, E4, and so on and so forth uh, from C4 up to C5. Uh, if you look down here, you can see that for every sample, the root key is the same as the low key and the high key. This means that everything is just on a one-to-one -one ratio. I hit a key, if there's a sample at that key, it plays it back. It is always the root key and it never goes and transposes. It never changes speed. Problem though, is that this only gives us one dynamic level. We still have only the level of the sample at the volume that it was recorded. If we need more than that, we need to use what's called velocity layers. This uses the velocity value of a MIDI note that's played on a keyboard. Uh, the velocity is how hard you've hit that key. And that allows us to control which key or key range is played. And in this case, the key ranges are going to be represented vertically in the sampler, showing low to high velocity going from the bottom closer to the virtual keyboard to the top away from that. And in addition to dynamics, velocity switching is really common for changing the articulation of notes. Uh, timbre by adding filters or effects to the sample uh, velocity layers. The downsides of velocity switching is that you have to have another set of samples for every note in every dynamic level. Uh, exceptions exist for things that only have one or two dynamic levels like a toy piano or a harpsichord which only have one. Uh, and it gets a little static if you're hearing the same samples all the times, even with a change in velocity. So the solution to that, and this is where it starts getting very complicated, is what's called round robin sampling, where multiple samples are stacked on top of each other at each key value and each velocity value, and are randomly selected when that stack is triggered. Again, huge improvement in terms of the quality, but you keep getting larger and larger file sizes. So here is just a really quick uh, view of velocity switching. Uh, so now, in addition to having a sample associated with the root key, I also have low V and high V. That corresponds to low velocity and high velocity. So for sitar 7, that is set to a key range of E4 to F sharp 4, has a low velocity of 0 to 63. Then I have sitar 5, which again has a root key of E4. It has a range of E4 to B4, but the velocity starts on the low end at 64 and goes to 127, which is the maximum velocity on a MIDI keyboard. So if I play with a very light touch, I will trigger sitar 7. And if I play the same note at a harder touch, I'll trigger sitar 5, which is really, really useful. It lets me have two different articulations that sound completely different. But if you want multiple articulations and you want something more realistic and you want to switch between different techniques, you need what's called key switching. Uh, this is found primarily on better sample libraries like East-West, uh, UVI, or the Vienna Symphonic Library. Key switching is using MIDI messages that change the set of samples played to allow different articulations across the velocity layers and across the round robin stacks. And to do that, it uses MIDI values on keys that are outside of the range of the instrument uh, or other MIDI uh, control channel messages to select the articulation that's being played. The articulation change message must come before the next note is played, but this allows you to do things like change from bowing to pizzicato on a string instrument, uh, to change between different types of picks on guitars, or to change from uh, regular fingers to slap playing on a bass. The downside though is that you have massive file sizes. Um, I am not kidding when I say I'm over one and a half terabytes on my desktop just for the East-West installation for the basic orchestra. 
And here is a view of the solo cello in East West. And you can see it's got uh, keys that are kind of bronze. Those are outside of the range of the instrument. The white and black keys are the keys that the instrument can play on and that will trigger sample playback. And then the blue keys over to the left are the key switching keys. And those are associated with different playing techniques like uh, sustained without vibrato, sustained with vibrato, uh, detache, uh, slurring, flautando, tremolo, pizzicato, and other different types of cello techniques. And of course, this is only a subset. You can actually reprogram those to use very, very uh, specific sets of techniques for any given project that you're working on. Finally, we get to sampling type three, the idea of musical quotation and borrowing from another performer. So the idea of borrowing musical ideas goes back pretty much forever. Uh, whenever the first composer evolved back in uh, caveman days, the second composer borrowed from him. Uh, there's a lot of examples. Uh, there are any number of masses that are based off of the popular tune L'Homme Armé, or The Armed Man. Uh, it's a popular medieval tune. Uh, the use of Dies Irae from the uh, Requiem Mass uh, by Berlioz in uh, Symphony Fantastique, by Liszt, by Rachmaninoff uh, in Isle of the Dead, uh, Saint-Saëns in Dance Macabre, and Yzai in his uh, second violin sonata. Uh, Bach quoting Vivaldi in some of his orchestral works, and vice versa. Uh, Bach also used German popular songs in the final variation of the Goldberg Variations. And then Charles Gounod, of course, of course quotes Bach. Uh, Mahler and Shostakovich both quoted their own earlier works. Ives quoted, uh, quoted, not quoted, uh, George Cohen. And Bartok uh, actually parodied Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony in his Concerto for Orchestra. All of these composers did that by explicitly writing out copies in musical notation format. And this is the important part, is that by copying the musical notation, they are essentially copying instructions on how to perform the piece, but it's not a perfect copy. You will never copy every nuance of a performance. There will always be slight differences. A performer might choose to hold one note out just ever so slightly longer than another. Um, it might be that you have different instruments playing. It might be that you have different articulations. It might be that the volume's a little higher or lower. There will never be a perfect reproduction. You would have to have literally thousands of instructions, and even then, most performers will never be able to perfectly articulate it the same way from one plane to the next. Digital sampling, however, is a one-to-one -one direct copy of the actual music, including all of the performance nuances. Things like the sound of the room that it was recorded in and its reverb. Volume fluctuations that are so small that the human ear can't perceive them, but we can measure them digitally. Uh, interpretive decisions like pitch bend or vibrato groove or swing that is not notated in the part or in fact can't be notated uh, in fact it is the actual performance frozen in time and copied it would take thousands upon thousands of instructors for a, for, for a performer to try and recreate it but a computer can just copy everything over with no loss it's similar to quotations in a term paper in that it's a direct reference to another work that can be used to elicit an intellectual or emotional response from a listener or to reinforce a point in your piece. But doing it without clearing the copyright of the sample will result in lawsuits. And many, many artists have been sued over this, uh, so don't do it. In fact, many digital audio workstations like Ableton Live, uh, Logic, and Pro Tools all come with samples that you can use royalty-free without any copyright restrictions. Use those instead. <laughs> but that talk of uh, direct quotation does lead up to a very interesting uh, idea of musical borrowing, which is the mashup. The most 
uh, traditional type of mashup is the A plus B mashup, where you take two songs that we call A and B, and you mash up the vocals, also called the Pella from a cappella, from one, with the instrumentals, also called the stems or the mentals, of the other. While it's called an A plus B mashup, typically you use more than two songs, though. And generally, these are the mashups that are made by amateurs. Uh, they're not commercially available, generally because of copyright issues, but they do circulate on the net. Uh, keep in mind, these are not remixes. Remixing is a totally different subject where you are taking the actual master files of a song and you might be uh, changing the order in which the files go, uh, changing the mixing instructions of EQ, filtering, etc. maybe adding another part, but you're working with the actual master files, and you're not just taking song A, song B, and combining them. Uh, with the mashups, the most popular form that I've found on the net is what's called genre clash where songs of contrasting styles are mashed up for a comedic purpose. Uh, you can see this in some really cool classic mashups like the Grey Album, where Danger Mouse took Jay-Z's Black Album and the Beatles' White Album and did a mashup of those. Uh, you can also find really popular ones like uh, there is a mashup of Gwen Stefani's Hollaback Girl with uh, the traditional bluegrass tune Man of Constant Sorrow. Uh, but this has a really long history. Mashups go back as far as what's called code libet, which is uh, Latin for anything goes. And it demonstrated humor or technical virtuosity by inserting musical quotes into serious pieces. The most famous of which is probably Bach's Goldberg Variations, which quotes two uh, drinking songs from Germany that were popular at the time that he wrote it. Uh, Kraut und Rubin. And ich bin so lang nicht bei dir gewest. And those both occur in uh, variation 30. Uh, Ives quoted uh, Dixie and My Old Kentucky Home in his piece, The Things Our Fathers Love. And of course, uh, Berg quoted uh, Bach's Chorale Es ist genug in the second movement of his violin concerto. Mashups, as we know them, developed in the 70s and the 80s, but were really perfected in the early 2000s with the advent of easily accessible digital audio editing software. Originally, they were developed to subvert copyright and culture and result in what's called culture jamming, uh, using culture to parody itself and to mash it up to produce things that were uh, either counter to the culture or that were making fun of it. You had some major artists during that time period, like John Oswald, Negative Land, the Evolution Control Committee, uh, Girl Talk, a personal favorite, and Danger Mouse, uh, where, again, he took the Beatles' White Album and Jay-Z's Black Album and mashed it up to create the Grey Album, which resulted in a massive copyright violation and lawsuits from uh, both... Jay-Z's and uh, the Beatles record labels, despite the fact that both Jay-Z and Paul McCartney uh, are on the record as enjoying it and actually liking it. <laughs> so in making a mashup, uh, basic digital audio workstation functions are needed. The clips need to be synced up so that they're always in time. They need to be synced up so that they're in the same key. And this is surprisingly hard to do well. But there are a lot of internet-based forums that will tell you how to do it and go into the history of it. Uh, there's a lot of jargon, though, because these are committees uh, and communities that have evolved over the years. So a lot of stuff you'll see, uh, if you research this more, you'll see the term stem or mental, which means the instrumental track, pella, which is from acapella, which means the vocal track, OOT for if something's out of tune, or OOK for if something is out of key. Uh, but they're very, very fun. I definitely recommend exploring these a little bit to get an idea of what they sound like and how that type of sampling is used. Keep in mind that most mashup artists are dedicated amateurs. They are, are not doing this professionally. And as a result, most don't want to be called composers. They prefer terms like producer, uh, 
artist. Uh, composter, which is kind of my favorite term because, you know, composer and compost mashed up. I didn't say it was a good joke. Uh, but most of the creators have day jobs. They are literally doing it just for the fun. Um, I've seen on a lot of forums where they say, I'm just doing it for the lulz. Uh, it's a really generous com community overall. There's a lot of stuff you can find on uh, Reddit in particular, with a lot of people off uh, often very happy to provide guidance for beginners uh, and to uh, look at the music of pros. Uh, it's just a fascinating use of manipulation of existing works to create new ones.